this is the type of piece made for export. This is actually a rarer style made for export because although it's hard to see on the image, it's actually with European decoration. And this actually was made in the period of Wan Li. So it is the end, or rather towards the end, of the Ming era. And this bowl would be about... A lot more finely decorated than the earlier provincial pieces. The provincial pieces were very simply done, weren't they, I noticed. And, That's right. And this, obviously, the later pieces is sort of, is it Kang, Kang Shi? Well, if we look at this piece here, um, this is the bottom half of like a, a picnic box. It really would have originally... It's a box, it's got, if you look, there's got two holes here, so it would have had uh, metal rings, it's a canister. So this was a typical piece used for export. But it's, a, uh, and this was made in the Kangxi period. So it dates from about 1680. Can you rotate it around for the viewer? But what's very important about this particular piece and why buyers would be very interested is the colour and quality of the painting. It's a very, very, very fine, fine very example fine, yeah. of landscape, which is a typical willow pattern uh, uh, piece which uh, shows mountains in the background, a lake, people on a boat, or, or people courting. Okay. Another piece which is actually this one here, which I want to show you. It's a little bit later, but this is basically what standard export is all about. Again, in the 1980s and 90s, I used to buy whole dinner services of this. There could be 80 or 90 pieces, meat platters, tureens, and a plate like this today is not worth a lot of money, maybe 60 to 100 pounds. Mm -hmm. And what date would that be? This dates from about 1770. There's no mark on the back. And one of the ways you can actually tell that this is export is that it's very, very thin. Uh, and, 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 and again, th there's little bits of what's called orange peel in, in the back, little dots um, which make it uh, the age that it is. In the modern reproductions, you might well see these dots, but they're all over the piece. Again, so if this, for instance, had a Qianlong mark or a Kangxi mark, it would be wrong. It would more unlikely be a fake. So if, just for argument's sake, one turns up in an auction room and it goes onto the internet and it's, uh, and it's described as... Uh, 18th century blue and white with Qin Long mark and it's got and, and it's shaped like this and it's got this decoration on, it's going to be a fake. Mm. So that's one good way of knowing whether it's genuine or not. And also the feel, the feel is, uh, is, pr is pretty light. No, it is quite light, yeah. Now, we're actually talking about another aspect of Chinese export, of pieces which are exported in the 17th century. I mentioned Augustus the Strong. If we look at the vases on the left, you remember in my talk about Augustus the Strong, how he swapped uh, soldiers to get a number of these large vases, which stand about um, this high. Again, this is export vases. They were not made for the emperor. Even though they were very large, the emperor, if the emperor had a pair of vases like this, he probably had them in his courtyard. They weren't considered imperial quality. So they'd, just be, export they'd be exported quality. to Europe. Just exported to Europe. Now, very interestingly, this um, 19th century? These ones, 19th century? 17th century. 17th, oh, sorry. From, from the... Um, uh, from, Kang, from the oh, Kangxi, Yang Cheng period. So it, it, it could be 1720, 1730. Now the jardin there on the right is exactly what I was buying in Hong Kong 
Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia in the 1970s and 1980s. And ironically, I was buying it by an inch. It was 10 pounds an inch back then. So, uh, and it didn't matter whether it was 17th century, 18th century or 19th century. Uh, the price remained the same. So I'd buy a 19th, jard 19th century jardinier like that, 24 inches in diameter, it would be 240 pounds. Wow. If it was 17th century, it would also be 240 pounds, irrespective that it was worth five or six times more. That was irrelevant to the Chinese. They didn't, they looked at these pieces being utilita utilitarian and not of much use other than being put out into the garden, filled up with earth and used as decoration. Especially if it right. had a mark on, which it could do, it could have a Kangxi mark, then it, of course it would be a very, very rare piece, but for, but it would probably be a provincial mark. It, it's not fine enough to be of imperial porcelain standard. So this whole image has a very, very interesting story. Back in the 18th century in England, huge taxes were applied to any porcelain that was coming in from the Orient into England. So what does in clobbered wares? In, in blue and white. So clobbered wares. So what happened yeah. is a lot, of, so they diverted the boats to Holland where they painted all the blue and white vases, then re-exported them so they could be re-imported back into England and avoid the huge taxes. And all of these vases became, and pieces with this added decoration um, became known as clobbered ware. And, was, the value, was the value less because it had been clobbered? Very, very much so. In the um, 80s, 90s, and even now to a certain degree, this type of decoration is very fashionable. Americans used to love it. It won't be so fashionable in China, but maybe there'll be a new craze and, you, uh, and people in China will start buying it. So they overpainted them, but could you take the paint off when they were back here or no. that was it? No, because it would be refired. There may be a way that the Chinese can do it because the Chinese will attempt to do anything. Now, just to give you an idea of size, uh, the vases in the center, on the center shelf, all the tall vases are about 18 inches high. Okay. Now, this is another typical decoration, European decoration made for the European market. Of course, this particular tureen is very, very rare. And um, it would have had an under dish uh, as well that accompanied it. But again, it would still be part of a very large dinner service that a member of aristocracy would have in his home. But I'm really just showing it because of the shape is actually taken after a silver shape. A lot of um, pieces of porcelain were in, originally made in silver, then copied. So if this particular piece had a Qin Long mark on it, it would be totally wrong. You wouldn't find well, really find it. It's a European it. shape, isn't it? It's so. a European shape. So again, but it's very feasible for modern versions of this piece to turn up with marks. So that would tell you straight away that it's not going to be genuine. Now we're looking at bog standard pieces of 18th century Chinese export, just like the plate that I showed a moment ago. This one here. Although this has got a willow pattern decoration, it's exactly the same date as the plate in the centre or the teapot there. 1760, 1780 sort of thing. Something like that. Now, if you pass me over that mug. This is a traditional export mug, isn't it? Traditional export. And another very, very good thing to do, don't do what I'm doing, holding this by the handle. But just imagine this was full of liquid because this was what it would be made for. The likelihood, if there's any weakness in the handle, it's going to break. Yeah. Always hold a piece like this like this. How much is how much is something like that worth? That's this about four hundred pounds. Again, it has the very very typical willow pattern decoration. Can I have a quick look at it? 
very finely done, isn't it? It is finely done. It's finely done, but there's no comparison in the painting. This is a, this is a lighter blue, that's a harsher blue. Well, this, of course, was done 100 years earlier. Uh, and it's a, a really beautifully rich blue. Yeah, but I mean, you can see bearing, the, quality, the, the, tight, the tightness of that is, is so much better than this. Bearing in mind, there were millions of those mugs made. How many, uh, and a lot less of these. Uh, if we move um, forward, I happen to just buy this on the way up here today. And this is actually part of an hors d'oeuvre set. So I've actually got four dishes which actually surround this. It would have been um, made to go on a wooden tray and it was just it's a later piece then though. it's a later piece and it dates from about 1880 yes. towards the end of the 19th century and, and again uh, very much for export and it's not really the sort of piece the chinese are necessarily looking for but you can tell it's real though can't you it's you can tell it's real it's got some age too and this border is a, a copied from an 18th century border so it's actually in the style of it and it all, again, it has an unglazed base. Now, another thing you will never ever find on Chinese porcelain is a seal mark, like a Qin Long mark, or even a 19th century mark on an unglazed base. That's another very good sign to look out for that it's Some fake. Good points for the viewer to notice, thank you. And also, going to that mug again, Again, that type of peep wouldn't have a seal mark or an emperor's reign mark on it. There may be occasion when it can actually happen, but it's unlikely to happen. It might have been done by a, a provincial kiln. So now we're looking at two 19th century copies of Earlier pieces. Earlier pieces that were originally made in the Kangxi period. So, in effect, the two jars on the right would have been copied from a style that was made at the time this uh, bowl was made. The pair of vases on the left oh, are what are called Famal Vert. And again, yeah. they would have been copied from a pair of Kangxi Famal Vert vases made. But they still have value. I mean, very, very 19th much century so. Famal Vert vases here can go for five to 600 pounds, couldn't they, for the pair? You've got, well, those are about 1800. 1800 pounds? No, those are about 18 inches high. Oh, okay. They can, the way the Chinese market that goes at the moment, they can be anything from five to 10,000 pounds or more oh, for really? a 19th century pair. Okay, wow. Shows my valuation skills on 19th century <laughs> Chinese porcelain. Now, if uh, holding this yellow ground dish, this is a very, very rare Ming dish made for the emperor. All these, cat these catalogues here, and, and the jar. You have one here, I believe, actually. And it's also very, very important. Is this the one here? Yes, that, that's something. Um, Yellow ground, blue decorated dish, fine Ming. And what is the, uh, again, so that's a Three this, million Hong Kong dollars, so. Well, back then it was hundred about uh, 200,000 pounds. I wow. don't know what date it was. Um, is it this same, is, and is this same? is actually the same dish or same dish. dish that actually dates from, um, this was actually sold in 1988. And that's the same dish from the book from Sotheby's. That's right. So that's Sotheby's catalogue. Sotheby's to Christie's, yeah. same dish. And this, for just for argument's sake, you can actually read it here. It actually says Sotheby's Chinese export and decorative. All of export and a lot of Chinese works of art that were made were considered to be decorative art and export as opposed to made for one of the Ming or Qing emperors and being imperial in quality. So what are we looking at here? We're actually looking at a modern reproduction of a pair of vases that should have been at their latest 
made like the pair on the left that were made in the 19th century. 1840s, 1860s. But what they're actually trying to do is to copy a style of Femmel Verde that was made about 1680. But this is a very crude copy. I mean, you can tell. Very, very much. And the other the thing, of course, you can... The detail is very limited. You can see a brush stroke around the outside to Very, make very it much. Aged. And, of course, the, that type of unglazed rough edge, it's the colour which is not genuine. And also, the th another very good uh, pointer t is that this was a lot that came up in the auction. So obviously the person who actually illustrated it wasn't that new or it wasn't old. So he didn't care about having the mark sideways. So what are the, uh, I can see, I can see there's six characters marked there on the side, if it's a, if it's a uh, auctioneers can make decisions, but for the viewer, give us your top sort of four points to, 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 to look out for, to spot a fake and to tell the It's the very, age. very hard. Look, I was, when I told I was giving this presentation, I was told Lawrence you're uh, shooting a <laughs> bullet through your foot. It's really impossible to tell. It's more about giving advice. It's more, it, it's more about Giving a feel for Get, that. Getting a feel, going along to a genuine auction at Sotheby's, Christie's, Bonham's, Woolley or Wallace, where they do handle, they have specialist Chinese sales. Buying a catalogue like this, I mean, this, I mean, and this is a huge double volume catalogue for Bonham's. It's a couple of years old. And yes, it will set you back. Uh, 50 pounds, 100 pounds. But it's important to get a feel uh, that you can't get so easily on the internet. Now, something else I want to actually show you before I actually show you. This is a genuine brush pot. Now, it's a different type of porcelain. It's called crackerware. You will notice a lot of cracks in the glaze. There is also bad damage. Bad damage, yeah. Something you've got to watch out for is the Chinese are very clever at faking. They will even fake the damage. They could put rivets into the piece to make it look older than it is. And what they do, they bury it into the earth to give an older feel, an older effect. This is the genuine article which has been unfortunately dropped. But this is something to be aware of. How old is that? This dates from about 1680, okay. from the Kangxi period. And again, it is glazed and unglazed. So, it's more, I think if, if, if you're coming to me, the questions you should be should ask me is how authentic is the information I'm giving you? Where did I learn this information? What guarantees are you going to give me that the piece is what you say it is? If it turns out to be a reproduction, can I get my money back? All these factors are very, very important. If I start to hesitate, walk away. And I, I think it's all about the credibility of the person. So more so than trying to say to me, how can you, how is this? Um, if you want to learn how it was old, you'd have to spend several weeks visiting me and I will show you a large selection of pieces. I'll go along with you to a cell and <clears throat> give you a much better idea of what is 18th century, what is 17th century, what is 19th century and what could be brand new. So the trick is, what you're saying, as far as I can understand, is to go to the big sale rooms, obviously, go to the British Museum or the, or the British Museum and go to the Oriental um, or Oriental departments in those museums and go through the different ages of the Chinese porcelain because they're all, they would be right. And very, you, very, 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 no, but, but even, with that, even they can make mistakes <coughs> and, and have made mistakes. Um, <coughs> so, uh, but of course, the other thing you've got to do is buy an old book like this, which I was showing to you before. Mm -hmm.
this would cost a couple of hundred pounds. Why it's important to buy an old book is you won't see any fakes in the book. You won't see any modern reproductions. So you're going to be seeing all these wonderful pieces as they originally were. Not faked in any way at all. And of course, the other person you should also go in to see is a specialist dealer. Yes. Because at least you're going to get genuine knowledge. Well, thank you very much, um, Lawrence. I think that's been really fascinating. It just shows it's opening up a whole new can of worms, so to speak, very to find so. out about the fakes and fakes and forgeries in the Chinese market. I mean, it's difficult, but your best advice is to use a reputable uh, dealer, to use a reputable auction house, and to go to the museums to check, do your homework, and obviously buy what you love. And if you need I to buy I something. Th I think you've got to buy, as you say, buy what you love, buy your pocket, what you can afford. If you can't afford it, don't let the dealer coerce you into buying it. Okay. Then, you, then you're going to run into a problem. Again, in the auction room, you know, you, you've got to think about exactly what you can afford. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Lawrence. It, it's, a, it's a tricky one. It is a very tricky one. Ladies and gentlemen, one. I think we've got a nice little overview and a flavour of the Chinese porcelain market there by, by Lawrence Mitchell. Thank you kindly, thank sir. Thank you. Appreciate it.